All right. Thank you guys so much for tuning back into my channel. I have such a treat today for you guys. We're going to be talking about sex and intimacy with the one and only Catherine Ellis. Um, she is amazing. Um, she has such a great following on Instagram. Um, so I just want to give you a quick background and introduction of uh, Miss Ellis. She is a sexuality counselor as well as a doctor of occupational therapy. She has a website where you can find her at sexintimacyot.com as well as drkatherineellis.com. Uh, she is also the founder of the Institute of Sex, Intimacy, and Occupational Therapy, and she's also an author. She is the co-author of the book called Sex and Intimacy for Wounded Veterans, A Guide to Embracing Change. What a title, guys. So I am so excited to introduce Miss Catherine. Miss Catherine, you want to jump on in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Yeah. I'm excited to be here. Oh, I am so excited yeah. for this because this is not a topic that is often discussed. So I am ready to jump in if you are. Yep, I'm ready to go. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So I just want to allow the people to just get to know you a little bit. So you can just kind of give us um, a little background history and, and what inspired you to become an OT and, you know, what got you down this path? Yeah, all right. Um, well, so I think... This, this all started with my affiliation for touch and the whole sensory system. Okay. And so originally I wanted to go into massage therapy um, and I wanted to have a profession where I could use my own body to help people heal. And this cued my mom into looking into, um, into thinking about occupational therapy. Um, and so we did research and keep in mind, I was like, I was 13 years old. So we did some wow. research and yeah, I was young. And wow. we, everything that I learned about occupational therapy, I fell in love with. And um, I liked, I just loved the focus on using occupation as a way to, within the intervention to get to the end goal. Mm -hmm. um, I did observation hours once I was in high school. And I just knew that this was the profession for me. <laughs> Wow, she so was really young. You definitely started young. I, I I think you're the first person I've met that said, "Hey, I want to be an OT at 13." <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that that is great. So, how did you come around to specializing with, in sex and intimacy? So that was um, more so once I became an OT, and it was really quick. It was like day two of being an OT. Oh, really? Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, I I always start early, so. Um, you know, I really wasn't interested in this specialty because of the topic. It wasn't about the sex that made me interested in it. Okay. Um, and this is at least not initially. And so I had a, from what I perceive as a fairly progressive upbringing around sex, um, at least from my perspective or perception compared to a lot of others, um, and I would describe it just as like not having shame or guilt around this topic. And so I felt like it was okay to talk about it. Um, and most of my own experiences were positive and fulfilling. Um, but I never felt like this was my calling. I was not in like college having sex toy parties or <laughs> like posting up, offering like free advice. Um, yeah. That was not really me. Um, no sex toy parties. <laughs> No, no, I didn't even go to, I didn't even go to my first sex load party until like after I had been doing this after the book came out. Um, wow. Yeah, so. I've never been to one of those. I'm sure it's fun, but I've never they're been to They're very, those. yeah, they're really fun, <laughs> especially wow. as an occupational therapist. Um, wow. Yeah, I think it's kind of an OT's dream. Um, but so I originally was attracted to it the most because it was, there was just a silence around it and there was a gap in our practice. And I was, I viewed this as a problem and a problem that I wanted to fix and an injustice that I wanted to fix and fill the gap. Uh, and so really I was most attracted to it because I felt like it was a problem that a lot of people um, for so many reasons shy away from. And, yeah. and then of course, like 
getting now like getting into it i i fell in love all over again because it is a really interesting topic complex and fun topic to to talk about yeah so what what um setting did you start off with when you uh became an ot did you just kind of jump right into learning it or, or where did you work for um initially yeah so my very first job was um at an active duty military hospital and oh. this is the job I had for the last nine years, and I just left in Jan- in uh, July. Oh. So I started out in the acute care setting, um, mm-hmm. just typical acute care. And I was working um, with people that had severe combat injuries, oh. and they would come back um, and be really, really sick. And there, a lot of times their spouses would ask about sex and intimacy. And oftentimes this was met with um, discomfort from the staff and a lot of judgment from the staff. Mm -hmm. And actually there was like a story where um, one of my coworkers had come, she was an OT and she came running into the office and she was beat red and she was like, you can't believe what just happened to me. And she said, um, I was showering. She was working with a a couple where, the service member was showering for the first time in probably three months oh, and wow. um, their spouse was in there with, um, with them. And the spouse took off, had a white t-shirt on and the spouse took off the white t-shirt and said, we don't want to have a white t-shirt contest up in here. <laughs> <laughs> so they did the shower like in their brawl and um, my, the OT that was there was really, she was really uncomfortable with the whole thing. Um, and she comes running into the office and she was sharing her discomfort. And like, I, I related, I, I related to that discomfort, but when she's telling the story, I was like, Oh my gosh, that sounds awesome. I was like, that just sounds really great. And, yeah. and that they were trying to keep um, the spark right. and the romance right. and the flirtation, you know? Right. Um, and so it just made me very acutely aware of how, um, the providers need as much help as, as the clients. And so that's why I almost immediately as starting my clinical practice with this topic, I also in parallel had the education practice so that um, providers could feel um, more prepared to discuss these topics with their clients. Okay. So did you kind of start like looking into like CEUs? Like how did you transition um, into really getting specialized with, with, uh, sex and infancy. Is there like special training, you know? Well, so I, you know, within occupational therapy, um, you know, the CEU training for that can be pretty sparse. And so Mm -hmm. I wanted to, I I really had to reach outside of the profession, um, and take CEU trainings that were, a lot of them are put on by the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. Okay. Um, and so I was looking for a lot of CEUs that were approved by that group um, to then learn um, what I needed to know and then kind of bring that back and through the occupational therapy lens, create my own continuing education courses. Got it. Got it. So what's your advice um, to your fellow OTs that, you know, they want to, you know, be able to train their clients in this, but you just don't know how to go about doing it. They don't know where to start. What, what, what would you recommend? Yeah. You know, I would say, I mean, first is like seeking out information. Um, and so, but also knowing that we should go beyond continuing education courses for that. Like some of this is just reading a book on, um, you know, like, sexuality and various ways of being sexual. So getting all the information that you can. Um, I consume a lot of media that's just related to sexuality and intimacy and attend community events um, on that have to do with the topics. I talk to friends, I engage strangers. Um, you know, and I also think it's important to read information and like consume information that's um, doesn't, isn't really, uh, relatable to my own identities or my own experiences. Um, and so I think it's important, especially when we're doing this work is to have a good understanding of your own identities and experiences and how, uh, your values and beliefs around sexuality so that you can begin to see them as perspectives among other perspectives. 
-hmm. and see that there isn't really a normal, um, but there is, you know, certainly like norms that we have that can create um, challenges for us as they, they can be biases in our clinical practice and kind of impact that therapeutic use of self. So yeah, I think the first step for anyone that wants to do this work is just having a good foundation of like, what was, what was your experience and like learning about other experiences that are also possible. Yeah. And, and with you saying that with therapeutic, therapeutic use of self, it kind of just makes me think about, you know, also culture, like, you yeah. know, how, how does this work with um, different kinds of culture and have you come across um, people of different religions and different cultures and how did you really handle that? You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think that's always an interesting topic. Like, does it change the intervention that I'm going to give? Yeah. Or is it more about tailoring the delivery or being sensitive about other topics um, or being affirming, you know, like yeah. being spouse instead of wife or um, you, the language that I use. So I, I don't think it often really changes the intervention mm -hmm. um, because I think we can kind of get in this challenge of like, okay, so someone maybe comes in and they're, they're Christian and, you know, they tell you that they're Christian, they're wearing a cross, like, um, and then, but you know that like an intervention that could be helpful might be masturbation. And we will say in our head, we could go, oh, well, they're Christian. They're very Christian, which is subjective yeah. compared to how Christian probably you are, you think other people are, right. you know, right. like, and honestly, I am just using Christian as an example because that kind of most closely aligns with some of my identities. But there are certainly other identities there that people can jump to conclusions and say, oh, well, they, they don't masturbate. And none of that's true. Mm -hmm. And none of that's true. <laughs> um, and, and also, if, if you do believe that that's a very good intervention strategy, then I think lobbing it out there as a suggestion, and then they get to choose whether or not they're going to do that. Um, and so I would, I, I would maybe just say something like, um, are you comfortable with masturbation? But I also ask that that same way with any client that I'm working with, regardless of, you know, perspectives or culture. So just mm -hmm. saying, are you comfortable with masturbation? And if they say no, then you make up a different, get a different suggestion. And if they say, you know, yes, then you can go in that direction. So, uh so the clients that you tend to see, are they coming to you and telling you what they want to do? Or you kind of have like a list of questions that you ask them initially, like an eval setup? Like how, how is that interaction, that first um, interaction with a, with a client or a couple? Yeah. Um, so oftentimes both. I mean, they, they show up and right off the bat, I want to get some like clarifying questions out of the way, like demographics or pain, you know, assessing for pain, assessing for anxiety. And then I want to know, like, why are you here? How can, how can I help? Um, you know, what's going on? And so then they usually share what's going on. And what I'll usually say is what's going on and what does better look like? Okay. So sometimes it's hard to get people to show up and be like, my sexual goal is, um, yeah. but you can, and, yeah. and to be Some honest, I just know it and other people yeah, are like, um, right. <laughs> no, some people certainly do. And that's all. Yeah. That's great. But another thing that's important, too, is someone might come in and say, um, you know, I want or, you know, I don't I don't enjoy sex or I want to have more sex. Um, and so it's or maybe sex is painful. Penetrative sex is painful. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps it could be my assumption that the goal is we'll tolerate penetrative sex, you know, with two out of 10 pain. Um, but until I, until they voice that, then I don't really know that. And so that's where that, what does better look like? Because sometimes it actually has nothing to do with that. Better look like might be, well, you know, really, I wish that I just didn't have anxiety every time my partner initiates mm -hmm. for fear of the pain that's coming. Yeah. And so really what they're sharing is that there's something going on in this phase where they feel anxious. And if that could get worked on and, and that's multifactorial, right? Some of that is helping to reduce pain, but some of it is also working with the anxiety. So um, 
I just think it's really helpful to say like, what does, what does better look like for that reason? Um, and that keeps me from assuming what better would look like. Okay. So, and then, yes. And then I have like a checklist of questions. So okay. it goes through, I'll ask things like, um, you know, what does the sex look like that you have? Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about your desire? How do you feel about your arousal? Um, what do you, what, how do you typically orgasm? Um, how's the communication? And then we'll also talk about like the intimacy side of things. So what do, how is the emotional intimacy? What do you do to share intimacy with your partner? Um, is that prioritized? Is that lacking? Because oftentimes if it is, it can be connected to low desire um, and low arousal and just sort of um, lack of connection really with the partner. So. Okay. Well, I definitely want to hear about like your techniques and, <laughs> and I think it, it's just, I think it's just amazing as OT, we were just holistic beings and the way we approach yeah. it is very holistic. And would you, would you say that this, that sex would fall under like IADLs kind of um, under that area of occupation? If, if, uh, yeah, covering? well, so, um, because some people would say that, oh, it's a, it's a necessity. Where else are people, you know, for life and other people would say, well, it's not so much. So where, where would you say that kind of will fall under that uh, area of occupation? I mean, if we're talking Maslow's hierarchy of needs versus ADLs versus what my opinion is, um, yeah. I, <laughs> okay, my opinion is that, um, this, and I reserve the right to change this opinion, but for now, and it has been for a while, sex is not a need. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good actually to label it that way because there can be a lot of stigma around, um, you know, I have to have sex with my partner because it's a need in the relationship or it's a duty. Um, or if I don't, then this will happen. Um, and, or, you know, or like if my partner um, want sex, then it's a need for my partner and I have to go satisfy it. Yeah. Um, that it's somehow my responsibility. So I think it gets complicated when we call sex a need. Okay. Um, you know, certainly I understand biologically it is a need to procreate, you know, for some of us, not all of us, but, yeah. um, you know, collectively that, that we need to have reproduction. Um, but quite frankly, now, I mean, we're really getting into it. Now we yeah. can have reproduction without penetration. So, you know, like, Isn't um, <laughs> we've come a far way. <laughs> wait, what did you say? I said we, we've come a far way. Yeah, we have, you know, and I, I think it's good because it's kind of separating out reproduction from sexual pleasure. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I actually think that that's only, if that's only going to help people fulfill themselves as sexual beings and also procreate too. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a need there. I mean, I think I, you know, might be more interested in saying there's a need for emotional connection. There's a need for um, orgasm. Uh, but again, all of these things, like we're able to do them um, not, you know, not necessarily with another person. So yeah. that's, that's just, that's my little uh, piece on that. Um, and so where did we even start with this? Well, it, okay. <laughs> under, <laughs> under the, okay. none of this. Talk about areas of occupation, but go ahead. I, I'm, I'm I, enjoying this. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, and actually, so the occupational therapy practice framework um, in the most recent, the last definition of sexual activity it had that it meets a relational need. And uh, myself, as well as tons of people that um, suggested new definitions, mm -hmm. suggested that that actually get taken out. Um, okay. And because it's one, you know, not all sex is relational. And two, it kind of has this, um, I think it reinforces that stigma around, um, you know, duty or my, it's my responsibility to fulfill someone else's needs. Um, so it is, that part is out, but now um, sexual activity is listed as an activity of daily living. Um, and intimate social participation is listed as an IADL. Okay. So, I, you know, I, I, I figured yeah. that. I'm like, let me, let me ask her. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. 
No, and I, I mean, I think it probably falls under, you know, grooming. Like we, yes, we have to eat, we have to eliminate bowels, um, we have to sleep, but like, you know, grooming, it kind of falls under that it kind of, I don't know, that's the one that I feel like it might connect um, the most to. So things that we do to ourselves. Um, okay. Yeah. All right, great. Well, I, I'm ready for like a, a juicy story. I want to know. <laughs> I want to know the most like memorable moment. I, you don't I, have any memorable. names or anything, but I, I'm sure the people out there would love to hear about you know your most memorable moment or or awkward, yeah. moment, whichever you want to, whichever. You, wanna <laughs> um, you know, it's really it's it's impossible to pick, of course, um, the most memorable. But um, I'll I'll go with one that I think had a variety of needs and goals, uh, which we addressed holistically. So I was working with this uh, gentleman who experienced polytraumatic injuries. And I worked with him and his spouse for about a year after his injury. Um, and they both agreed that their frequency was lower than what they wanted it to be. He reported a lack of sexual desire and his spouse uh, reported wanting more emotional connection, intimacy and help with childcare. She also wanted more sex, better sex, and was frustrated that he didn't desire it as much as she did. So <laughs> it was a lot, it was emotional. Right. Um, and so I discussed with them, I said, well, what does better sex even look like? What would that look like? Um, and it was largely limited by the physical limitations. And so I worked with them on different positioning that they could achieve. Um, a lot of times couples, a lot of times with like, there's like the injured person and the non-injured person and this, the recommendation is the injured person just lays down and the non-injured person just gets on top and quite frankly like I think that we can do so much better as occupational yeah. therapists yeah. um you know I'm that's like, like the basics that we know of like oh well yeah <laughs> like <the> I <laughs> yeah and like the the in, the non-injured person like maybe doesn't want to always be on top you know um and so with them, they found um, more like sidelining position to be very helpful and um, sidelining almost like a T. Um, and so that they, they found like that was, they were able to achieve the position, but also that it allowed for a lot of access of like touching and nipple play mm -hmm. um, and, and looking at each other too. So they, that, that works for them. Um, and I explored with the client his limitations for um, for desire, which he stated as stress, fatigue, body image concerns, and lack of spark and that connection with um, his spouse. And I discussed ways that they could change routines and so the patient could be more supportive of the spouse and um, like how he could manage, adapt household tech management techniques to be able to help out around the house more. Um, a lot of his therapy was focused on mobility and not a ton on things like taking out the trash or cleaning up the kitchen or doing laundry. Yeah. So, or even playing with his kid. Um, he had at, at times he had a kind of a low frustration tolerance. And so working on frustration tolerance with playing with the child so that sometimes the spouse would feel um, like they had to kind of referee um, yeah. the the individual and the child. So we, we worked with frustration tolerance and just, you know, play, imagining play. Adults need help with that too. And, yeah. and honestly, that only helps um, when we shift that context into more like bedroom context with playing. Um, so we talked about that. Um, certainly said strategies about building emotional connection, intimacy, and just pleasant time with each other versus the stressors of rehab and childcare and parenting. Um, the, the client identified as a car guy, self-identified as a car guy, and they used to take <laughs> long drives together when they were dating. Okay. And I suggested doing this again. And they both lit up and reported like, I think that would be really nice. We didn't even think of that. Yeah. And so and lastly, like we talked about taking pressure off sex to be, um, to look a certain way, particularly the way that it used to look, yeah. um, because a lot of problem solving does have to happen and people have to learn how to move their bodies and move around bodies. So 
Um, I suggested using like laughter and problem solving to make it feel okay, even if it didn't feel like really sexy. Right. And did you, did you find like the man, the man would have a harder time expressing themselves versus the woman? Cause you know, as women, we're very expressive and we're emotional. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you find that you had a harder time with the guys kind of expressing themselves? You know, I, I think that what's really, we have to be careful, um, you know, cause oftentimes females are more language based. They're more, uh, they have so much more permission to be emotionally expressive and to share their emotion and to get in touch with that. Whereas a lot oftentimes um, males can feel like they have to be stoic and very action oriented, right? But sometimes actions are, are quite difficult when you are limited physically. Um, and so it, I felt that just, just leveling with both partners and validating both partners and giving both partners a chance to express and feel heard, um, I think was, was really helpful there. Okay. And I also sometimes see them separately. And so I think that um, giving the, the client some time to meet with me separately and just sort of like express um, without the concern of having to um, like censor with their spouse there was really helpful. Awesome. Wow. So is there like special equipment that, you know, people use and it, is this only meant for, you know, um, people with disability? Do you tend to deal with all just regular day-to-day -day folks that need help with, with their sex and intimacy? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I work with all of the above. Um, okay. Certainly I got my start more with people that had um, physical uh, disabilities and Pretty quickly, it branched out to um, a really broad group. And I mean, you know, I often too wonder, um, you know, people, you know, anyone that's coming to work with me wants sex to be better and different. And so they have some sort of goal. They have a vision of what better would look like. And so, um, you know, whether I'm helping people like navigate or accommodate or just enhance their experience, um, okay. I have experience working with all of them. And is there like a lot of specialized equipment that you use um, for folks with disabilities? Is this something that's that they can easy is easy accessible to them, or is this kind of like using what they have, like pillows yeah. or you know? What yeah. I mean? <laughs> well, so there is a you know there's there's sex toys and there's like positioning aids like pillows, um, wedges, but not all of them are accessible. Depending if people have like fine motor limitations, not all of them are accessible for that for um, those folks. So with occupational therapy, we can even work on helping, you know, the device attach to their hand or their prosthetic hand. Okay. Um, and, you know, build, creating something there, building something there. Um, and then there are, you know, some really great companies um, that are putting out, you know, accessible sex toys. Um, and so like Handy has one um, that's uh, chin uh, controlled, controlled with the chin. Um, and there, so there is more out there like that, that we should be aware of and, and be able to find and recommend to our clients. Um, but I've also found just, you know, sort of toys that are more universal and, you know, maybe it's like a small vibrator that has a loop around it that can go over a finger. So you're not really holding on to it, but it's just like on the finger. And that I, you know, was able to see. So you can take a look at some of the devices that are there, or, you know, get on the internet and look or go to a sex toy store and see which ones might work for your particular client. Okay. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever felt um, uncomfortable at moments and times where you had to kind of stop the session or how, how mm. was that experience was, or maybe in the beginning when you started or are you completely yeah. comfortable now with everyone? <laughs> how, how did that you know, I'm sure there had to be some moments where it was a little, a little uncomfortable. And how, how did that um, yeah. go? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, this is a great question. Um, <laughs> and I think I have to answer it by first dissecting the various ways that you can feel uncomfortable. Okay. Um, so I talk about sex for a living and with people who are sexually struggling in one way or another and they find, and they themselves are nervous. So it's uncomfortable every time. 
and we can't wait for it to not be uncomfortable or not engage with the topic because our clients seem uncomfortable. And I always say that it's our job to, it's our job, it's not our job to not be uncomfortable. Mm. It's our job to navigate that discomfort and we get good at that through practice. Yeah. So I, there certainly there are times where I've felt, um, you know, like I didn't really know what to do or what to say or they, yeah. you know, but I was able to kind of get past that. Um, now, have I had clients flirt with me? Yes, a few times. Um, but yes, and this honestly doesn't make me feel uncomfortable. Um, I view this as them trying to practice their skills in a safe environment. So really, for me, that's never been a, a part that's made me uncomfortable, although it might make others. Um, have I ever felt physically threatened? No, but one time I did, I have a feel emotionally threatened. Mm -hmm. And um, like someone was asserting a power or a dominance, particularly over me in a way that was sexual. Mm. Um, and it was a male and it was in reference. Um, it was a male who made a reference to the ease at which a male could violate a female sexually because he just couldn't help himself. Mm. And okay. he directed this comment towards <laughs> me <laughs> And he like it, he like looked at me and he directed this comment towards me and it was really a difficult situation for me because I actually kind of froze up um, mm. and ironically and really fortunately it was the therapeutic dynamic was really interesting here because there was a student that was joining me for the session oh wow and so there were four people in the room. The, the the couple and then me and then the student and the oh, student there was, was a, a there was a couple situation I thought it was yeah. just a male by himself wow he's bold no the male <laughs> was saying this in front of um, their spouse so oh, okay um so the the student was also a male uh, and he really took the lead on correcting the person and was also really supportive to me afterwards and allowed me time to verbally process how I was feeling mm -hmm. and he also felt like he needed to process what he was feeling okay. and so while it was pretty traumatic um I am you know it's fortunate and I'm grateful that I had a colleague in there with me to validate me and sort of take on that emotional labor to correct the individual um or just you know and it was or or highlight to the individual how saying that could be problematic and then of course yeah. could perhaps be problematic for his sexual relationship with his partner um so we we were able to sort of turn it into something that was therapeutic hope, attempted to be therapeutic for the couple um but it wasn't me that had to then you know also do that kind of quick shift because i was pretty i felt kind of frozen wow wow yeah wow well, let me ask you this, for all the um, uh, OT students, um, the CODAs out there, uh, how can they uh, become successful with this? Is, you know, what, what kind of um, training would you recommend to them? Because um, I know you do a lot and you have your, your website. What, what, how can our OT yeah. students be successful when it comes to the certifications? I know you offer that. Why don't you uh, tell um, us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, like seeking out information, different media, different, um, you know, books, community events, all of those sorts of things is going to be really helpful. Instagram accounts. Um, but for OT specific training, you know, we, um, I have CEU trainings available for people to help um, enhance their skills and feel more comfortable with the topic. And so people can head to, um, my website, uh, as you said, sexintimacyot.com and um, join the, the newsletter because I put out um, trainings periodically. And so we have trainings that are focused on just like beginners, you know, sexuality and intimacy throughout lifespan, using assistive devices in practice. Um, something I felt like people were always asking, well, what does this look like in practice? What does this look like in practice? So I made a training that's called um, the typical treatment session. So it kind of, it takes four different treatment settings and two scenarios for each setting. So you've got like eight different scenarios. 
um, that people can kind of pull from and extrapolate to generalize to their setting that they're in. Um, I also, I do um, program development group coaching. I do that three times a year. And that's um, like a group setting. And we just kind of help whatever your idea is, we help you workshop that and then implement it. Um, the, the last Tuesday of every month, I run a, a small group session. And this is called um, Guided Self-Reflection of Sexuality, Values, Beliefs, Attitudes, and Biases. And this is that sort of guided self-reflection that I was chatting about, um, doing it in more of a group setting and very intimate. Um, and we can really learn from each other's perspectives when we do that. So all of those are things that I particularly offer. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of, or there's other sex educators in the space. And I think that we could maybe, um, if you want to add that in the description section too, and just kind of highlight how people can be followed. Yeah, I'm going to definitely, um, for everyone that's, that's viewing, I'm definitely going to add in um, Catherine's website um, where you can get in touch with her as well as all the information to um, jump on her uh, certification course. And how mm -hmm. long is your course for? Well, so, and it's, it's more, um, we're working on certificate courses. So that isn't like fully built out yet. We have a goal of getting that um, over the next five years, just, you know, what sort of tiers and requirements, but any class, any course that people take with the Institute is, will count towards a certificate. Um, I have, so a lot of the trainings are about one to two hours. Um, the group coaching training is three hours or six hours long, but it's one hour every other week. So it's kind of spaced out and that's a live event. Um, all of the other trainings uh, or a lot of the other trainings are recorded so people can take them at their own pace and, you know, start and stop. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, I want you to just talk a little bit about, about your book because like, we didn't get to really spend I oh, yeah. mentioned it in the beginning, but I really want you to be able to tell people about this awesome book. And I love <laughs> the title, by the way, you know? <laughs> yeah. So this book was really cool. Um, this came out in 2015 and it was a nonprofit. It was a nonprofit project that I did with the Bob Woodruff Foundation and Semper Max Support Fund, which funds um, educational materials and um, you know, efforts for our uh, service members and veterans. Mm -hmm. And so um, really the book um, came from at the time, you know, that I was writing it, it was, I was doing a lot of treatment sessions with these folks and uh, people kind of wanted something that they could take home and just read in privacy. Okay. Um, and clinicians wanted something that could start the conversation. Okay. What I found is that we all feel a little bit more comfortable when we have a piece of paper in hand that's like, yeah. hey, this is, you know, was important enough for somebody to write something down. Um, and so it was really used as a way to open up dialogue and have conversations. So um, it came out in, like I said, 2015. It was a really, it was a really fun project. Um, I definitely learned a lot with it. And all of the, um, what's really cool is that it's, it's on, you can purchase it on Amazon or you can also do bulk purchases. If you, if people can get in touch with me to do like a bulk purchase for their clinic and it's um, all of the proceeds go to purchasing free books for veterans or service members. Awesome. Um, so, so if there's I'm any put the description of that below, yeah. I'm, I'm going to get all that information for you guys and you just check the description below. We're going to have all of that where you can um, purchase the book and support. For, yeah. support your veterans that's great that's great so this was this was an amazing interview I feel like we got so much do you want to just tell people how they can get in touch with you um through social media um if you want yeah. to just mention your website again I know you got two yeah. websites let's <laughs> let's let them know how they can get in touch because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions after this is over of course so um the uh, the institute for sex intimacy ot that's www sex intimacy OT. And that's the same for the Instagram handle, sex intimacy OT. And then I do have my clinical website is drkatherineellis.com. Um, and also another thing um, that I would recommend for people to do is head to my website and we have free member resources page, which hosts tons and tons of curated resources 
that I wanted to centralize into one space for OTs because I know how hard it is to be able to find these resources. Mm -hmm. And so people can find that on my website and also be sure to sign up for the newsletter, which I also use to send out educational resources on sex and intimacy topics uh, frequently to stay in the know about the trainings that I have. Um, and then also too, there's a Facebook group. So we've got a private Facebook group that there's a lot of really good exchanges on there. Um, and other OTs in this space are sharing what they're doing and sharing their opinions and their resources. And that's been really cool to see flourish. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I think this was absolutely amazing. Again, guys, definitely go check her out. Be sure to subscribe, um, hit the notification bell as well. So you can um, get some more content uh, from me and definitely check Miss Catherine out. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me, uh, Catherine. I appreciate it. all the information will be down below guys. All right, Catherine, thank you again so much. Yes, thank I you very much for having me. <laughs>